Hey there, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you need a website, then you should definitely check out Squarespace and more on that later. This video is gonna be an advanced user guide for the Canon R6 Mark II. Now the R6 Mark II is one of my all time favorite Canon cameras. I've owned it since it came out in late 2022. And just to put this also in perspective, I've used pretty much every recent Canon camera. So I'm very familiar with the Canon operating system. As I said, this is an advanced user guide. So I'm gonna make some assumptions that you have some basic experience and knowledge with the R6 Mark II and cameras in general. Now, the point of this video is to take you as a beginner or intermediate type user to more of an intermediate or advanced type user after watching this video. So you're gonna learn a whole bunch of stuff. Big disclaimer though, there are lots of ways to do all this stuff and I'm just gonna show you how I like to use the camera and why I do it that way and I'm sure you'll learn a few things. So I will be using the R6 Mark II in this video, but a lot of what I'll be talking about will also be applicable to the R8 because they have the same sensor and processor, but it'll also be applicable to some of the other Canon mirrorless cameras. Before we get into everything here, I just wanna give a little bit of an overview of what you can expect in this video. And I also wanna let you know that there are timestamps down below so you can skip around or revisit sections as needed. So that's there for your convenience. First of all, we'll go through the camera settings in their entirety. I'll show you exactly how to set up the camera and how you can get the most out of it. We'll talk about manual mode, log shooting, why and how you go about doing this, getting proper exposure and white balance, slow motion, time lapses, XLR audio, some other features, and then recommendations for memory cards, lenses, and some other stuff. Now, so we're gonna go through the camera and we're gonna step through the entire menu system and we're gonna use the advanced features to get everything we possibly can out of this camera. So now let's set up the camera and go through the entire menu system. And as I said before, we're gonna be using all of the advanced features to get the most out of our camera for shooting video. I do wanna mention that I won't be covering everything in the menu system, so if I don't talk about something, it means I don't change any of those settings. So there's a couple things I wanna point out on the top of the camera, because I'm gonna be referring to them as we go through this. First of all, over here, we have the switch to go from photo to video. Make sure you have it on video, obviously, because that's what we're gonna be focusing on in this video. For the mode dial, make sure you set it to M for manual mode, because we're gonna be shooting in manual mode. Over here, we have, starting at the front, we have the shutter button, the MFN button, this button here we can use to change exposure, which we're gonna use is for shutter speed. We have the record button here. We have the power switch to go from on to lock to off. And then this dial up here, which we'll be using for aperture. So I just wanted to point out some of that stuff that's on top of the camera. So I've reset pretty much everything inside this camera, except for a few things <laughs> that I had to set up just to do this demonstration. So if we press the menu button up here, we can go into the menu and there's a couple things I wanna point out here. First of all, we have different categories at the top. So we have like the camera, the autofocus, playback, and so on, like the wrench. So we're gonna be using those and inside of those we have multiple pages and then different options. So there's a couple ways to navigate through this. You can use the, uh, the wheel here on the set button and that'll bring you up and down. And then if you, for example, select something, you can use this to toggle between things. Now to press the menu button, it brings you back a level. Now the other thing is you have this joystick here and the joystick you can move left and right and up and down and you can also um, select things with this by pressing in on it. So same idea there. And then if you want to go between the big categories at the top, you can use this dial up here, which we're gonna use for aperture to toggle between them. And I do wanna point out one thing here in that the firmware that I'm using at the time of recording this is 1.1.1. So if you're watching this later, this is the firmware that I'm on at the moment. So another thing I wanna point out here about just the general structure is there's this Q button here. So if you press the Q button, you get a whole bunch of more set, more settings here. We're gonna talk about this and how to use this and also how to customize this later. So you can get out of that by pressing the Q button. So let's go to the menu and start diving in. So we'll go back to the beginning here and start up at the top. So the first thing is movie recording size. And we have all these different options. So. We're gonna be shooting mainly in 4K24 IPB. So when you see 23.98, that is 24. Now this camera does not shoot in all eye and it doesn't shoot in raw internally. It does record raw external, which we'll talk about later in this video, but you can choose IPB or IPB light. Now IPB is 170 megabits per second when you're in 24 frames per second. And IPB light is half of that or 85 megabits per second. So. I just wanna mention that I shoot in IPB all the time. I haven't done extensive testing of IPB versus IPB light, but 
I find that the bit rate of 170, 170 megabits per second is pretty good, so that's what I decided to shoot in uh, most of the time. Now, I also want to point out that this camera only shoots in UHD, so that's a 16 by 9 ratio. It doesn't shoot in DCI or a 17 by 9 ratio or anything wider than that. So just keep that in mind. These are the options. And so basically the two different modes that I'm going to shoot in here are going to be the 4K24 and the 4K60. So those are basically the two options. And you can see here all the things I just mentioned, those 3840 by 2160 in IPB. So like I said, it shoots in UHD. So we're going to select the 23.98 IPB. Now the high frame rate mode, which we will talk about later in terms of shooting at above 60 frames per second. So if you turn this on and off here, uh, this will allow you to get to frame rates above 60 frames per second. The movie cropping mode, this is for shooting in an APS-C crop. So if you do that, it will shoot in a 1.6 times crop, which is very handy. And I use that quite often, so that's really nice. Now in terms of sound recording here, I want to change this from auto to manual. I do not trust the auto levels in this camera. So once you hook up your microphone, you can adjust the recording level to what you want. I usually aim for around 12 with maybe some peaks around six or so, a negative six or so, but not much higher. So set that. Once you have your microphone in the environment that you're in, make sure you set that and make sure you don't clip it. So make sure it's a little bit lower and you have a little bit of headroom there. The wind filter, I disable this. And I also the audio noise reduction, I'm going to disable this. So I don't want the camera doing any audio processing on its own. We can do that in post if we need to. We just want to make sure we capture clean audio. Okay, so going over to the second page here, and we're not going to talk about exposure compensation because we're going to be shooting in manual. The ISO speed settings, uh, we're going to set this to 800, but we could do this later. Might as well set it to 800 now because that's the base of C-Log3. We'll talk more about that. You can change the ISO range if you want, and right now it's set to the max of 25,600, which you can raise it up to 51,000 or 102,000. It doesn't really matter. I'm never going to shoot that high. <laughs> so you can set it to whatever you want, but I just want to let you know that that is in there. And nothing else on this page. Onto the third page, there's a setting for the aperture to be in 1 8 stop increments. So you can enable this, and this only works with certain lenses. But when by default, when you change the aperture, it changes by 1 3rd of a stop. So this will actually change it by 1 8th of a stop, which if you really want to dial in your exposure with aperture, you can get a much finer control. Also, when you are rolling and recording, you can actually step through this and it won't be as abrupt as third stop. So I generally don't uh, change the aperture while I'm recording very often. So I'm using the ND filter for that. Again, we'll talk more about that later. So I leave this disabled, but it is a really cool option that's in there. Now onto the fourth page here, the white balance. It's set at auto white balance. I pretty much never use auto white balance. So in general, when I'm, we're gonna talk about custom white balance as well in this video, but in general, I'm gonna be using one of the presets or just changing the Kelvin manually. So if I'm outside and it's sunny, I usually use daylight. There's options for shade, cloudy, tungsten, and so on. This here is the custom one, as again, which I showed you. And then lastly, you have, if you just wanna manually dial in the Kelvins, you can do that as well. I find that most of the time I get pretty close with some of the presets or as you get more experience, you can dial in with just the Kelvins. But I'm gonna set it to set it to sunny for right now. In terms of the picture style, this is only gonna matter when you are not shooting in log. I tend to just leave this in neutral um, if you are gonna not shoot in, in log. Standard I think is a little bit too much, so I do like neutral. But again, I'm not gonna be using this, but for whatever reason, if I need to shoot with, the, with log off, I, I would probably put it in neutral. So Canon log settings are super important. We're going to be going into this menu for a couple things. So first of all, we want to turn the log shooting on. And this camera only shoots in C-Log3. So with some of the more recent Canon cameras, they stop putting C-Log, the original C-Log, in, in their cameras. And they don't put C-Log2 in any of their mirrorless cameras, unfortunately. So we only get C-Log3, so that's what we're going to select here. There's a couple other options in here, first of which is the view assist. And I generally recommend turning this on. What this does is it basically adds a display LUT into the camera. So when you're looking at it on the LCD screen, it shows a little bit more contrast and saturation, which is really helpful for judging exposure and color and stuff like that. The one downside with this is you can't actually use the, the uh, false color in this, which we'll talk about later. And also it doesn't export that over HDMI. So if you're using an external monitor, 
that monitor needs to have a LUT in it to basically convert the log footage into a, a viewable image for you in like a Rec. 709 look. I don't change any of the characteristics, and it's great because this, the sharpness is already defaulted down at zero, so we don't want to add any in-camera sharpening. For color space, you have three different options here. I recommend shooting in cinema gamut because it'll be the widest gamut and give you the most information. And generally, when I'm mixing this camera with other cameras, I'm also shooting in cinema gamut, so I recommend shooting in cinema gamut. So here we're gonna go into the lens aberration corrections and you can see what lens I have on here. Where I have the RF 24 to 70 and I generally turn these on if they're available because a lot of these will get fixed in camera and they're a lot harder to fix in post, especially things like distortion when you're working with video. So if you're using a third party lens or something else, like they may not always be in here, but I generally turn these on because it'll give me a better looking image uh, right in camera. Now one thing here that's new with this camera is focus breathing correction, also known as focus breathing compensation in the Sony cameras. So this is a really cool feature, and if you don't know what focus breathing is, basically every lens has focus breathing to some extent, some are way worse than others. Uh, and so when you are racking focus from near to far, you will see that the uh, basically the focal length changes, and you can see this at the edge of the frame because it'll move in and out and it'll appear like it's breathing. So when you turn this feature on, it will eliminate the focus breathing in the lenses. Now this only works with certain lenses, and you have to make sure that you update your lenses so they have the newest firmware on them so that they will work with this feature. I made a video about uh, focus breathing correction. I'll leave that video linked down in the description with a bunch of other videos. So you can turn this on and off. I only turn it on when I need to because sometimes it does crop in just a little bit. So keep in mind, if you have a lens that breathes pretty hard and you wanna turn that on and off, this is where you do it. So just wanna show you where that is in here. The other thing on this page is the high ISO speed noise reduction. Now this is an interesting setting and I made a detailed video about this talking about what you should set it to. Generally, it you know it comes set as standard, which is actually okay. I like to leave it at low because I don't really find that it does much destruction to the image and it really does take care of a lot of chroma noise. So I would leave this on low or standard. Uh, you could obviously leave it on off and do all the noise reduction in post. That's definitely an option, but I generally like to leave it on low. So the next page here has the pre-record settings. This is a really cool feature in this camera where if you are aiming at a subject and you hit the record button, you have the option to pre-record either three or five seconds. And this is neat because like if you're shooting sports or wildlife on an event, and let's say you're filming a bird and the bird takes off, you could hit record and it would automatically record five seconds or three seconds ahead of time. So really cool feature to play with. That's in here if you wanna turn that on and off. And the movie self timers here if you want to set the timer and then it'll start a little bit later. So, bunch of stuff on the seventh page here. So, first of all, the image stabilizer modes are here. Now, you can access them here, but you can also access them through the quick menu. And I'm going to talk in depth about the image stabilizer modes in this. One thing I want to point out is that, you know, right now I have the RF 24 to 70 on here, but if I had a manual lens on here, this is where I'd go in and manually change the focal length. So I don't have that lens on here, but if you do have you know, a manual focus lens, you have to manually set the focus focal length in the camera or the IBIS won't work properly. So the IBIS, you turn on and off with the, uh, the, the switch on the lens. Again, we'll cover this later, but the settings are also in here. Customize quick controls. So this is the Q menu, like I said before. And so we can actually edit the layout, which is cool. So we can remove some of the stuff that we may or may not use. So for example, I'm gonna take out the card selector and I'm also going to take out the picture style. I don't use those. And you can go down here and add some other stuff. So for example, uh, maybe we want to add the focus peaking and zebras. So now those will be in there. And if we wanna rearrange them, you can hit info. And if you wanna move like peaking, you know, you can slide this around and you know, you can go through there and customize it and make it however you want. Now, not everything is available there. So for what you want, but for me, this is pretty much how I have it set up because I have the stabilization, the white balance, the zebras, the autofocus subject detection, uh, the crop cropping here the peaking, like all the stuff in here I use on a pretty regular basis. So that's kind of what I like in the um, in the Q menu. And again, to get to the, uh, let's see, save and exit. So to get to that, we just hit the Q button. And like I said, we have all that stuff that's in here. 
So going back to the menu, shutter button function for movies. This one is super important for me. Uh, this is when you fully press it, this will allow you to record using the shutter button. So as I said before, there's that record button on the top, but I like to use a shutter button because every camera's got a shutter button, that's my default. So make sure you turn this on or it, when you hit the shutter button, it won't start and stop recording video. So make sure you turn that on. The meter timer, metering timer, um, I generally set this to 30 minutes, but like I say later on in the video, we're not even gonna be using the exposure meter on this camera anyway, so I just set it to 30 minutes. The zebra settings are in here, which we will cover later on in this video as we get proper exposure. And so I will go into that later, but generally I'm gonna leave this on 45 for the way I expose. So I will talk about later, as I said. Shooting info display. There are a bunch of settings in here. So this is all the different things you can turn on and off with you when you scroll through the info. And what I mean by that is that when you press the info button, these are the things that toggle between them. So you can set that up in there. Same thing with the viewfinder uh, info. You can toggle them on and off there for what you're looking in through the viewfinder. You can turn grids on, so three by three, six by four, and so on. So if you're looking for a rule of thirds or you know some something like that, you can use the grid display. Now histogram display is important because I'm gonna be using the histogram to get the proper exposure. So we want it set on brightness, but what I wanna recommend is on small. And the reason for that is if we have it on large, it's just way too big, so we're gonna set it to small. And later when I show you the exposure, I will use large just to demo it, but if you have it on large, it's pretty pretty large. And I'll show you, let me just show you what that looks like. So if we leave here and we hit the info button a couple times, this is the, expo the uh, histogram. You can see it takes up way too much real estate. So I'm going to turn that back to small. Lens info display, you can show the focus distance uh, when you're in manual focus. So I don't really care about the focus distance. I'm gonna disable that. Uh, I'm just gonna change it to feet if I do wanna turn that back on later. The focal length display I love. And so this is great because when you are out in your home screen, it will show you the focal length here. So you see it says 24 millimeters. That's because I'm zoomed out all the way. That is super handy. I love that it's in this camera. Now, there's a couple other things in here. Uh, the recording emphasis, uh, this is a red box that flashes on and off. Let me show you what that looks like. So when you hit record, you have this red box that flashes on the outside of the screen. I find it to be distracting. I like how it's kind of thin, but the, the point that it flashes kind of bothers me. You also have this light here, which flashes. So I'm gonna turn this off. I prefer to turn this off. So let's go in here, turn that off. And then you have aspect marker ratio, so. A lot of good stuff in there. Okay, now onto the last page of the camera section. If we go into the quick control screen, there's an option here for a second quick control. And this is interesting because this is actually new to the R6 Mark II in terms of the Canon operating system. So we've already been talking about the quick menu, but this actually allows you to have a second, or it's actually second and third page, I'll show you in a second. So if we select this, it allow us to get into that second control menu. So if you don't, select it here, you won't be able to get into that second quick control menu. A lot of people ask me that. So we're gonna to go to okay here and let me show you how it works. So if you press the Q button, we get into our quick menu, which we saw before. But if we press it again, we get into this second quick menu. And there's some really cool stuff in here. So we have like movie cropping mode. We have high frame rate mode. We have uh, recording options to auto switch between cards or record to multiple. So if you want to dual record, you can do that. I'm just gonna leave it on standard for right now. And then if you want, there's two dots up here. If you want to get to the second set, you just use the dial up here so you can change your log settings. You can quickly get in and change your uh, frame rates and recording sizes. And then you can also turn HDRPQ on off if you were not in log. But anyways, that's all in there under the second quick menu. Viewfinder display format, there are two different options, so you pick which one you want. I'm gonna leave it on the first one. Now the standby low resolution, this is a, it's something that allows you to save some power when you're just not recording. I turn this off because I want the maximum quality on my screen possible, even in between takes. I'm willing to give up a little bit of battery life because often I'm looking at the screen to set up a shot, get exposure, focus, that kind of stuff. So I want it to have um, a really, uh, the best possible image on the screen. 
Now, before we get onto the HDMI display options on this camera, which are kind of funky, I need to take a moment to talk about today's video sponsor, which is Squarespace. If you're a creative, a content creator, or a small business owner, you need a website. Believe me, you really do. Now, I'm really excited to have Squarespace sponsor this video because I've been personally using Squarespace for years. Your website can be as simple as a landing spot for people to find your contact info and social media, but it's a great way to show off your photos, videos, portfolio, artwork, etc. They even let you host videos directly. There is no need to link a YouTube or Vimeo video and it looks a lot more professional and seamless. It's simple to set up a website with their amazing templates. They make it super easy and anyone can do it pretty quickly. They have lots of other cool stuff like the ability to set up an online store, schedule appointments, or have member areas. You should definitely head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Josh Satin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Link in description. So now let's get into talking about the weird quirkiness of the HDMI display options, the raw output, all that kind of stuff. So over on the camera here for the HDMI display, we have this set to the monitor feature. And I have a Ninja V over here precariously balancing on a lens so it's kind of even with the camera here. Now for the monitoring stuff, it does not have to be a Ninja V. It could be any mon HDMI monitor, but I have this right now. And this is what we're gonna be talking about when we're talking about the, uh, the raw uh, external recording. So there are two different settings for the HDMI display options. The first one here, it's set to monitor. So when I plug in the HDMI into the Ninja V, basically it's just gonna show you everything that's on the camera. So let me show you that. Okay, so this is basically what we just saw on the camera, now it's on the screen. So when I use the camera, basically what's on here is just gonna be what would have been on the screen. Now, this works like normal, and if you wanna record, you can hit record. It's we're gonna record internally inside the camera. If you wanted to, let's say, record internally and externally at the same time, if you're recording on this screen here, you're gonna get the, the display information that's coming from the camera. So one way around that is if you press the info button a couple times to cycle through that, now we have a clean HDMI. We can record internally like you just saw and externally. The problem is we can't see what we're doing. We can't monitor anything with the camera. So this is kind of a funky way to do this. So let me hit the info back on so we can see what's going on on the screen here. And then let me talk about the other option here. So the other option is both. And so there's a warning that pops here. Card recording is not supported. And so basically let's select this and I'll show you what's going on. So now it tells you you cannot record to the card when the display is set to those that setting. So now what was going on here is that on the camera you have a view of what's going on and you have all the settings and it spits out a clean HDMI feed. The reason why you don't see anything is because there's a cap on here. If I try to move this to show you, you can see that what's showing up on the screen is also showing up on the monitor, but it's a clean feed. So there's no information going over to there. So you can get a good external display if you're trying to record externally. So this would be what I would be using if I was recording externally because you can operate the camera, you can use touch focus, you can see all the settings, and you get a clean HDMI out for monitoring or for external recording. The problem here is that you can't internally record when you have it set up this way. So again, if you wanna record internally, you have to go back to the other setting. So as I said, very, very quirky. Now let's talk about the raw recording options in the R6 Mark II. I made a detailed video about this, which I'll leave a link down below with all those other videos. But let me give you some tips here about setting it up and some of the options and those sorts of things. Now you can record externally, not internally, to an Atomos Ninja V, V Plus, or Shogun, and you have to make sure that your firmware is updated on those devices, otherwise it won't work. So let me show you what's going on here. If we go down to HDMI raw output, we're gonna turn this on, and then we're gonna go back to the first page under the camera settings. And when you look at movie recording size, you can see it already looks different from before. But we're gonna click on that and you have two different options. Now the first one is for what's gonna be sent out over HDMI to your Atomos. The second one is gonna be like a proxy that you're gonna record to the second slot, your second SD card slot, not the first one. You can set that up to be something different as a proxy, so that's kinda of cool. Now we're gonna go in here under HDMI and we can see a few different options. So firstly, here we have 4K24 RAW, which is kind of weird because if you look up here, it says 6,000 by 3,374, so that's 6K, but it says 4K RAW, 
Either way, it, it's weird, but that's what we're gonna select. So you can also shoot in 6K 30 raw and 6K 60 raw. So we're gonna choose 4K 24 raw. And then again, you can go in here and you can select either uh, 1080p IPB or IPB Lite to be your proxy going to the SD card. So you have that option. Now, another interesting thing here is if you can also go into movie cropping mode and turn on the uh, APS-C crop. And so now when you go back here to the HDMI settings for RAW, you can see that the resolution is different. Now, this is really weird to me because this camera, you know, shoots 4K in crop mode. But when you shoot in RAW, it shoots in 3744 by 2106, which is less than 4K. So to me, there's got to be some upscaling going on when you're shooting in the APS-C crop mode in general in this camera. But either way, you can shoot in crop mode in RAW in 24, 30, and 60 frames per second. All right, so I'm going to back out of here and make sure I turn movie cropping to disabled so I don't forget that. Now, let me hook up the Atomos and show you what it looks like in there. All right, so as we back out of the menu here, you can see that the Atomos gives us a information screen here. It says raw signal recording. Press OK to continue with ProRes RAW. So let's do that. So now if we go into the menu system here and we go to input, you can see that I am getting a 6K 24 frame per second signal, which is great because we're sending, remember, 6K raw over to this. Now, if we go over to the record, you can see we have a few different options for codecs. So right now, it automatically switches over to ProRes RAW. This is not ProRes, this is ProRes RAW, which is different, and you have a few different compressions here. You have HQ and you have RAW. I don't want to think about what HQ is. ProRes RAW is absolutely massive. Now, one thing I want to mention here also is that the Atomos does a pretty good job to let you know if something's wrong with the RAW signal because right now it's set up in RAW mode. So if you go and turn the RAW settings off in the camera or if you just press the menu button, what happens in the Atomos is there's this little uh, icon that pops up here that says not RAW input. So it lets you know that you're not sending out a RAW input into the Atomos. So anyways, I just want to show you how to set all this up. And if you want to learn more about it, I said to go check out that video, which is linked down below. So now that we've gone through all the raw settings, I want to make sure I turn this off because I generally don't shoot in raw in this camera. So going over to the next section, the autofocus section, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, so first of all, movie serv servo autofocus, we can turn this uh, to enable, or if you want to turn the autofocus off, I just use the switch on the side of the lens usually. There's also subject detect autofocus, which I will hit on later and show you with an example. The autofocus area you can change. I usually leave it on whole area, but you have options for flexible zones, uh, expanded autofocus, one point autofocus and spot autofocus, like if you're looking for certain things, but I find that whole area works well with the sub detection and also with touch tracking. So I just leave it on whole area autofocus. Now subject to detect, we have a few different options here. And one thing that was brought out new with this camera is the auto feature, which is great. So I, the auto feature does work really well, but I still am just trained to like choose what I'm shooting. So if I'm shooting people, then I'll set it to people. If I'm shooting animals and so on. The other thing you can do is turn it to none and that just does a general autofocus for the, for the scene. So that's also good too, but I'm gonna leave it on people uh, for right now. Eye detection, you can either have it disabled so it doesn't do eye detection, auto, which means it automatically picks right or left, or you can pick just right or just left. Now, you might be wondering why you wanna pick right or left. Sometimes if you're doing like an interview and you're doing like a side angle shot and you just want like the person's left eye in focus, you can just, you can select that. But I usually leave it on auto and it does a pretty good job. The switch track subjects, now this is really interesting to experiment with. I usually leave it at one, but you can make it to zero or two to make it either less likely to switch subject or more likely to switch subjects. I find that if you leave it on zero, sometimes if it loses focus on what it is focusing on, it takes a long time or it won't even go back and find the thing you're looking for. So I generally leave that on one. So for autofocus speed and tracking sensitivity, this is where you change those. Again, I leave those as default, uh, just right out, of the, right out of the gate. So I don't change anything in three or four, but there are a bunch of settings in here if you want to get around and play with them. So in terms of focus peaking, this is something I do use quite a bit. And I will talk about this a little bit later on the video when I go through and talk about autofocus and, and manual focus features. But this is where you change it. I like the level at high and the color on red, and you can turn the peaking on and off here, but we also set up in the Q menu. With the focus guide, this is something I will show later too. This is a really cool feature, but I'm not gonna get to it at the moment. 
So one thing I do need to change on the sixth page is going to be the RF lens manual focus ring sensitivity. And this one is absolutely huge to change. So all of the autofocus lenses that we use are what's known as focus by wire. So when you rotate the manual focus on there, it doesn't actually change the focus. It tells the camera something and then the camera tells the lens what to do. So there's a disconnect there. And there's two options here. One is varies with rotation speed and one is linked to rotation degree. Make sure you switch this to linked to rotation degree. And basically that is like the amount that you turn it is the amount that it focuses. If you use the first one, the faster you turn the ring, the faster it will focus. I find that to be really hard to work with. So make sure you change that setting. So there's a whole bunch more stuff in here with the playback options. I don't change any of these things and I don't change anything with the you know connection settings. There's a bunch of stuff in here to play with but we're gonna skip all those for now because I usually leave those as default. All right, so into the wrench section here, the first uh, option is the record function and card folder selection. You can do things like pick that the photo and video go to separate cards. Uh, you have different record options for, you know, which card gets recorded to. If you want to switch automatically, record to, you know, separate cards, record to multiple, all that stuff's in here. You can also change the folder that they go into. So you can go through here and customize everything, but. Most of the time I'm just recording to card number one. One thing I like to change in here is the file name. I guess this didn't get reset, but what you can do here is you can change your user setting to whatever you want. I set it to R6 Mark II, and that way when the file comes into the computer, it says R6 Mark II with a number. So I know that whatever I'm bringing this in, I know that the R6 Mark II footage is labeled because I'm often bringing in you know, stuff from other cameras so I know which one is which. So that's really handy. And then make sure that you set the file name to R6 Mark II and that your files will be R62 and then the number. If you have two R62s, R62A, R62B, etc. This has been really handy for me. You can also format the card, which uh, is very handy to do, and this is where you get it. And you can change the date and time and stuff like that. On to the next page here. One thing I get asked about a lot is the video system. So a lot of people will say, hey, I can't get 24, uh, 30, and 60 frames per second, and I see 25 and 50. That's because you're in PAL mode, not in NTSC. So if you can't see the frame rates that you want, you change to NTSC, you'll get 24, 30, 60. If you change to PAL, which is in Europe and some other places, you'll get 25 and 50. So a lot of people ask about that. For mode guide, make sure you disable this, and feature guide, disable this. Those are all the, the little things that pop up to tell you what's going on. We're not gonna need that, it's just kind of annoying. Onto the third page here, uh, the beep, I'm gonna disable that. I personally don't like the beeping when you're recording and pushing buttons and stuff, so I make sure I turn that off. The headphone volume is here, so that's where you can adjust that. And then the power saving, I have all of these disabled, and I did that before I got started because uh, I needed to make sure that it didn't time out. But generally, that's how I leave it. I leave everything as disabled. And I'm, if I'm not going to use the camera for a minute or two, I just turn it off. I'm pretty conscious about it. So I don't want it to be shutting off when I need it to be on. So I just turn these all to disabled. All right, so the screen viewfinder display is interesting because it allows you to customize how you either look at the, the LCD or the EVF. So let me show you that. So right now it's set up on screen only. So there is a sensor right below the EVF here where if you put your eye up to it, it will automatically switch if it's in the right mode. So I'll just show you how it works with my finger. So right now it's on screen only. So if I put my eye up to it, nothing happens. You can also choose viewfinder only. That'll just turn the EVF on. You can also do two different auto modes. So let me show you the first one here. Auto mode is only screen. So if I select this and I go to put my eye up to it, nothing happens. The only way it'll work is if I close the screen, then when I put my, my eye up to it, it will switch. So that's auto one. Auto two, let me change it to auto two. Doesn't matter if the screen's out or not, it will switch. So it will depend on how you wanna set up the camera. You can also change the screen brightness here. So make sure you set this up properly. I have it at four right now, which I think is good for this tutorial. Um, just be careful that you don't turn it up too high because it can really mess with your exposure and how you judge exposure on the screen. So change it depending on how bright it is outside, but you can crank up the screen pretty bright on this camera. Onto the fifth page. One thing I love is the shutter at shutdown. Make sure this is closed. And what this is, is when you turn off the camera, it closes the shutter to protect the sensor. So when you're switching lenses, you don't get dust on it. Absolutely love this feature. Make sure you turn that on. 
Onto the last page here of the wrench, you can reset the camera. Another thing is the custom shooting modes, and that's the dial on the top. You can set it to C1, C2, and C3, and they'll be different for photo and video, which is really handy. So the way that you do this is you just set up the camera however you want. Like if you want one to custom mode to be in 60 frames per second, one to be in crop mode, just set up the camera however you want. Go to register settings, hit custom shooting mode one or two or three, and you set the settings in there. And now when you switch to C1, C2, or C3 on the top of the camera, it will go in and change those automatically for you. So set up everything in terms of autofocus modes, log, not log, white balance, aperture, everything you want to set up, you can set up and then put it in your custom shooting modes. Those are really handy. And then the other thing on here is just the firmware. So if you need to update your firmware, you can check that out right here. And again, you can see the firmware for the lens as well. So moving along, we'll go to the third tab in the last section before the My Menu section. So you can go here and customize the buttons and you can have separate buttons for photo and video. I don't actually change any of these. I kind of like how they are, but you can go ahead and customize them. I do want to mention that there's only certain things you can use. It's not infinitely customizable. There is a lot of stuff to choose in here, but from what I found is the Q menu pretty much has everything I need. So I just hit the Q menu, go in there and get what I need. But let's talk about the dials here because I want to change some of this stuff. So first of all, the button that's up on the top front near the shutter, I want to set that to shutter speed and it actually is already shut to shutter speed. So that's great. The dial up here, we're going to set that to aperture. Again, this is just personal preference, but this is what I like. So I'm going to set that to AV. Now the wheel on the back here around the set, I set that to ISO. That's just what I've been trained with for so long. And lastly is the control ring that's on some of the lenses, like the RF lenses uh, and, you know, for ones that have it. I actually turn this to off because I don't want it on anything because I tend to bump it and change things. So I just turn it to off. Some people set it to white balance or whatever, but basically I just, I'm going to turn that off. And lastly, on the fourth screen here, I am going to go to audio compression and disable that because I want to have the best quality um, audio in the camera. Lastly, release shutter without lens. I want to turn this on in case you're using a manual focus lens. Make sure you uh, turn that on. And that is it for the menu system. The My Menu over here, you can add stuff to it if you get to it regularly. I generally don't need to use this very often because I said between the Quick Menu and the multiple pages on the Quick Menu, it's pretty easy to get into all that stuff. Now that we've gone through all the settings in the camera and have it set up and ready to go, now we need to talk about shooting in manual mode. Now, if you want to unlock the full capabilities of this camera, get the best possible exposure and image quality, you need to shoot in manual mode and learn how to get that dialed in. It's actually a lot easier than you think, and I'm going to show you how to do that in detail in this video. So first of all, I don't want to get into too much depth about basic exposure stuff. I'm assuming that you know some of this stuff, but remember there are three different things inside the camera to control the exposure. We have the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. So we're shooting right now at 24 frames per second, 4K24, and we want to get our shutter speed to be double our frame rate. That's a good general rule of thumb when you're shooting video. So for us, we're at 24 frames a second, so we would want the shutter speed to be 1 over 48. Well, we can't do that. We get the closest we can get is 1 over 50. So I'm going to change the shutter speed. It's at 1 over 125 to 1 over 50. So that's what we're going to do. So if we're shooting in 60 frames a second, we'll set that to 1 over 125, etc. This is the aperture here. It's set it at 5.6, but we're going to change this depending on what we're doing. Remember, the lower number will give you a more shallow depth of field and allow more light into the sensor. The higher number will allow you to have a deeper depth of field and bring in less light into the sensor. So we can change this depending on what we're doing. The ISO over here is set at 800, which is where I want to keep it most of the time. The reason why it's 800 is because the base ISO for C-Log3 in this camera. So those are the three ways that we can control the exposure in the camera. And there are two other ways to control the exposure. One is using an ND filter, which we can either put on the front of the lens, or if you're using an adapter, you can put it in the adapter. And you can also control it with fixed lighting inside, something like that, if you have actual lighting that you're applying to the scene. So when we are outdoors, I am only going to be using two things to control the amount of light getting to the sensor, the aperture and the ND, because I'm not going to adjust the ISO, I'm not going to adjust the shutter speed. When I'm indoors, I'm basically going to be using the aperture and lighting, and occasionally I might need ND for very certain situations, but most likely just aperture and lighting. So when it comes down to exposure, we're really only playing with two variables. So outdoors, you're using aperture and ND, and inside, we're using aperture and lighting. 
In addition to shooting in manual mode, I highly recommend that you shoot in log. And I know this can be scary at first, but it's actually really easy to do. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that in this video. Now, the reasons that why you wanna shoot in log are basically you get the most dynamic range and you get the maximum flexibility in terms of grading the image to get a really high quality image and also exactly what you're looking for. So in terms of dynamic range, dynamic range is going to be the difference between light and dark in an image. If you have a wider dynamic range or a larger dynamic range, you can see more into the highlights and more into the shadows at the same time. And when you watch movies and high quality video, you can really see a lot of what's going on in the scene and it makes it look really awesome. So you wanna to try to capture as much dynamic range as possible. And that's one of the biggest reasons why you shoot in log. So let me give you an example here to demonstrate this, to give you some motivation. So I shot this little clip here of me standing outside and I'm in the shade, so I'm fairly dark and there's the sky behind me, which is pretty bright. So I expose for the sky to not clip the, high, the sky and make sure I preserve that information. And when you take a look here at the examples, you'll see that the first one with the standard picture profile without log, there's really not a lot of information, I'm very dark. But when you take a look at the log image, you can see that there's a lot more information and the image just looks a lot nicer because I was able to capture more dynamic range and also grade it to look exactly like I want. And there's a huge difference between these two examples. So that kind of gives you some information, some motivation to shoot in log. But first of all, what is log? Log is a logarithmic equation that the camera applies to the output from the sensor and basically compresses the information down to try to save more highlights and more shadows. So what it looks like coming out of the camera, well, I'm shooting right now in C-Log2 on my C70, and this is what it looks like coming out of the camera. You can see that it's very flat. It does not have a lot of contrast or saturation, but then after you grade it, it looks really nice. You can make it look however you want. Now I'm gonna break this down into two examples to show you the two different methods that I use to get proper exposure in C-Log3, and these cover most of the situations that I find myself in. So the first one is when I'm outdoors in a run and gun situation where I'm very quickly trying to get proper exposure and I'm just trying to capture as much light as possible and get as much information to the sensor as I can. Then after that, I'll do an example where I'm using a control lighting situation like I am here in a studio or for an interview or something like that. So I'm outside and I wanna demonstrate how I get proper exposure in C-Log3 using the histogram in a run and gun situation. Now, there are several other exposure tools, one of which is this guy down here, which is the exposure meter, which most people use when you get started. Ignore this, it's just the camera making a guess of what's going on, but as a videographer and filmmaker, we need to take more control over our exposure and get a, a more accurate exposure that we're recording in our camera. So first of all, there are a couple different options for exposure tools. We have things like false color and waveform, which you can get in external monitors. Now this camera does have false color in it, but I find it to be a little bit cumbersome in the way it works. And I usually use it in more controlled lighting situations. So I'll show you how that works inside when we're trying to get exposure in a studio or controlled lighting situation. So this right here is the histogram and generally I keep it on the small setting, but I have it on the large setting here because it'll be better for demonstration purposes, but I find it takes up too much real estate in the large setting. So this is what we're gonna use here. So what this is here is this is a representation, representation of everything that's going on in the scene. So over here on the right hand side are gonna be the highlights and over here are gonna be your shadows. And you can see that all of the information is in between. So we're not losing any information here, which is great. So when you have information that sort of bunches up on the right hand side, you'll be clipping the highlights. And if you have it um, bunching up on the left hand side, you'll be crushing your shadows or losing information in your shadows. And you really wanna make sure that you don't lose any information because you wanna try to record as much dynamic range as possible. And I find that one of the best things to do when you're trying to get proper exposure in a run and gun situation is really just make sure you don't clip your highlights. It really makes your footage look a little bit more amateur, a little bit more DSLR-like or mirrorless-like. You wanna make sure that you don't clip your highlights and they'll just go to white. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna basically expose as high as we possibly can without clipping our highlights and then back it down just a little bit. So let me show you how this works. So first of all, talk about our settings here. We're in 24 frames a second. We have the shutter speed at one over 50. The aperture, we're gonna pick whatever we want and the ISO is at 800, which is a base for C-Log3. So let's pick an aperture. So let's say we wanna be at F3.5, depending on you know, whatever depth of field that we're looking for. And now that everything's set, the only way that we're gonna control our exposure here is by using our variable ND filter, which is on the front of the lens. So I can control that to let in more or less light. 
So you can see is once you get this set up, it's actually pretty quick to adjust your exposure. All you have to do is twist the ND filter. Now, if you're in a situation where you want to open up the lens wider, you might need a stronger ND filter. But for me personally, I generally, a one to five stop is what I'm using right now, is works really well for me. It kind of just lives on the front of my lens. So let me show you how this works. So we pick our aperture, like I said, f3.5, and then I'm gonna open up the ND filter to let in more light. And what's gonna happen is you'll see the histogram move to the right as the image gets brighter. So you can see the image getting brighter. And what happens is if you open up the ND filter so much, you see the histogram start shooting up on the right-hand side, which means that there's information being lost in the highlights. And you can see that it's really bright, like on my skin and also the, uh, the road back here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna back off and dial the light down a little bit. So adding more ND till it's not clipping. That's how I would expose it. So it's pretty self-explanatory there. Let me show you again. Let's pick a different aperture. Let's go to like F4. I open up the ND to let in more light until it clips. And then I just back it down a little bit. And then I just go a little bit further to be safe. That's how I do my exposure. Now, let me show you on the other side of it what happens when you crush the shadows. So for this, let me stop down a little bit. Let's say I'm at F9. And you can see if I add a little bit more ND here, what's going on here is that the information here or the histogram is bunching up on the left-hand side of the graph. And you can see that it's really dark. So right now I'm losing information in the shadows. So for this, I would just open up the ND filter and make sure that I'm not crushing out my shadows. Pretty straightforward. If you stick to this and try to get as much light to your sensor as possible without clipping your highlights, you'll be in pretty good shape. Now, before we get on to talking about how to get proper exposure in a control lighting situation, like here in my studio or in an interview type situation, I wanna talk about this guy here. This is a gray card and this is an invaluable tool for myself. I use this here in the studio every day and I also use this when I'm out to get proper exposure and also get a custom white balance. These tools are very inexpensive. They're like 10 or 15 bucks. They're gray on one side, white on the other. You can see it's pretty dirty. I need to clean it or get a new one or maybe get a second one. They fold up really small. Uh, I'll put a link in the description if you wanna pick one up. You should definitely do that. Uh, these are great tools to have. So what are these so good for? Well, first of all, you can set your custom white balance with the gray card on this side, and I'm gonna show you how to do that in a minute. Also, because it's middle gray, you can set your exposure properly using the exposure tools inside of your camera. Now, all camera manufacturers will give recommendations for exposure of middle gray in their log curves in their cameras. So Canon, for example, they tell you to expose middle gray at 35% in C-Log3. And if you're using the false color system in the R6 Mark II, you'll use the green color. Now I did a bunch of testing before to see if this gave me the best possible image. And what I figured out was that actually overexposing the R6 Mark II by one or one or third stops gave me less noise and a better overall image quality. So what I'll show you here in this example is I'll show you how to expose by the book, what Canon tells you to do, and then I'll also show you how to overexpose it by one stop. Well, let's go over how to get proper exposure and white balance in a controlled lighting situation using a gray card. So always position the gray card where the subject is gonna be and so you can get the subject properly exposed. So <laughs> I have it clamped to a chair here, but either have your subject hold it or you hold it or whatever. Just put it in the place where you want the proper exposure and then you can adjust the lighting around it. But you wanna get sure, make sure the exposure is correct where the gray card is. So we're gonna be using two different ways of getting proper exposure. We're using false color and zebras, but we're also gonna be using two ways in terms of lighting and getting light to the sensor. So we can control the aperture and we can control the lighting. And of course, ND too, but we don't need ND in this situation. So take a look at the gray card here. Uh, we have a key light coming in from the right-hand side. So it's gonna be a little bit brighter on the right-hand side than the left-hand side. This is common. Usually your key light's off-centered and even if you're using fill, or a fill light or, or bounce or something like that, you're gonna, it's gonna be brighter on one side or the other. So I usually aim for the center of the gray card to be properly exposed. So you'll see that here. Okay, so let's start with false color. Uh, I think it's a really accurate way in this camera to get proper exposure. I generally don't use it very often because you have to turn the view assist off. So let me show you that. So if we go in the menu here and we go to the seventh tab over and we go down to false color, you can see that it is grayed out and that's because there's a few reasons that will keep you from using false color if your zebras are on, if your peaking is on, or if the view assist is turned on. So if we click on it, we'll say, oh, Canon log settings. So basically that's because our view assist is turned on. So if we go back to the fourth tab to Canon log settings, you can see I'm in C log three, but my view assist is turned on. So let's turn that off. 
So now if we go to the false color section, you can see it's not grayed out and we can turn it on. Now, what's cool here is that the false color index is also in this camera and easily accessible. So if we click on this, this is a little chart that will tell us what each of the different colors represent. So if we're exposing based on what Canon tells us to do for C-Log3, we're gonna aim for green for the 18% gray, that's middle gray. But like I said, I've, in my testing, I found that this camera makes a much cleaner image when you are exposed one stop over. So what we're gonna use for that is going to be the pink, which is one stop over middle gray. So I'll show you both of these. You can play with them and see what you like. But personally, if we're in a scene that does not have extreme highlights, I'm gonna to try to expose one stop over to get a cleaner image. So if we back out of this, we will see that there are colors on the screen. Now there again, there are two ways we can control the exposure using the aperture and the lighting. So let's start with the aperture here. So we're at, in terms of settings, we're at 24 frames a second, shutter speed one over 50, ISO 800 of course, base ISO and C-Log3, we're at F9. So I'm gonna open up the aperture here to get, bring more light into the sensor. And I would say at like F5.6, we are properly exposed because that's the green, that's based on what Canon wants you to expose for C-Log3. And then if we open it up one stop more, getting it to be one stop overexposed, so third of a stop, third of a stop, third of a stop. So we can see here that at F4, we will be one stop overexposed. Like I said, this is where I would expose this using the pink. So at F4 would give us proper exposure. So that's how you do this with the aperture, but let's say you wanna do this with, with the lighting. So let's say for your scene, you wanna shoot it at, let's say F3.2, because that's the desired depth of field. So then all I have to do is adjust the key light, which is what I'm doing here. I'm adjusting the intensity of the key light. And you can see that once you get the key light to be down the middle in terms of pink, that would be properly exposed. So, uh, or not properly exposed, properly exposed for me, that would be one stop over. So let me change this back to um, properly exposed at F5.6 like we had before. So I'm gonna raise the intensity of the key light here. So something like that. Okay, so that would be what Canon says. And of course, if I open it up again, one stop, that would be overexposed by one stop. This is how I would uh, expose this. Okay, so now let me show you how to do this with zebras. And so to do this, we'll go back in the menu and we will turn off the false color. And we will go to the zebra settings. And we wanna check our zebra levels. And if you are gonna be properly exposed based on what Canon says for C-Log3, you wanna be at 35%. Now their tolerance of this or the accuracy is pretty bad. It's plus or minus 5%. So that means we're gonna be anywhere between 30 and 40%. Our zebras will light up. And so we're trying to get 35% for C-Log3. So keep that in mind. I'll show you how to work with this. Uh, it's personal preference what you wanna do here, but let me show you this. So let's turn the zebras on. And when we back out of this, again, remember this was properly exposed for C-Log3. You can see that the gray card is all uh, covered up with zebras. Those are the stripey lines. So. I told you it's a range. So the way that I do this is I generally, let's close down the lens here. So you can see that the zebras slide off at F8. And at F4, so you can see that we go back to F5.6, we are right down the middle. So that's how you would expose that. You just move the exposure off and on and then kind of go down the middle. You can also do that with the intensity of the key light. So if you're gonna do this for uh, one stop over, if we go in our zebras, you want to set this to 45%. So 45% for one stop overexposed. So if we go back here, you'll see that we are underexposed. So if we open up the aperture, remember we had proper exposure at F4 for one stop over, this is what we'd have. And the same thing is if you overexpose the image, you'll see it'll slide off. And we underexpose the image, right, we can get it right down the middle at F4. So that's how you use zebras here. And generally, once I properly expose the image, then I will do the white balance because I want to make sure that I am getting uh, the intensity of the light correct in the scene because that can often change the white balance of the scene. So let's go and do the white balance now. So let's turn off the zebras. And the white balance feature in this camera is very antiquated. It's in all the Canon mirrorless cameras. It is very accurate, but it is kind of weird. So let me show you how to do this. So what we're gonna to need to do is switch over to photo mode. So I use that with the top button on, uh, on the top of the camera. And then I'm gonna change this over to uh, the auto mode. You can see how little I use the photo mode in this camera. And then we're gonna take a picture. 
So once we took the picture, I'm gonna go back to video mode. I'm gonna change the top dial to manual because I think you have to be in manual to get custom white balance, not sure. If we go into the menu and we go to the fourth tab and we go up to custom white balance, we select that and then what it does is it takes the last picture you took, which is the one we just took, and we're gonna set this based on that gray card. So we're gonna hit the set button, which is in the middle of the dial. It'll say, do you wanna use the data from this picture? Yep. So now it's set the custom white balance based on that gray card to the custom white balance setting. So when we select this, we're gonna go up to the white balance and we're gonna select custom white balance, which is what we just decided. And so now this image is properly exposed and also has a custom white balance. And if you want, you can turn the view assist back on to get a easier image to look at. So remember that's under Canon Log settings. View assist turned on. And now have a little bit more color and saturation and contrast. So there you go. That's how you get proper exposure using zebras in false color with a gray card and also how to get a custom white balance. So both of those situations, which I just showed you, we had enough available light to get proper exposure. So the question then becomes, what happens when it's too dark? Well, when you're shooting in low light situations, the best thing you can do to start with is, of course, remove your ND filter altogether to give the most light to the sensor. Open up your lens as much as possible, or maybe put on a faster lens, put on like a prime lens that has a, a lower aperture. If you're in a situation like that, where you, you do all those things and you don't have any more light, and you can't add any light with you know, controlled lighting, you're forced to raise your ISO. And in that situation, that's the time when you should be raising your ISO, but only until you've exhausted all of these other options. I really try my best to not raise the ISO. You can get some decent mid-range performance out of the R6 Mark II, but once you start pushing the ISO too high, that's when you start getting noise in your image. But only raise your ISO when you've exhausted all those things, taking off the ND filter, opening up your lens all the way, and adding controlled lighting. So if you get through all that and it's still too dark, that's when you can raise your ISO. Now in terms of grading C-Log3, I made a detailed video about that and I wanna cover that in this video. I'll leave that video linked down below. You should definitely check that out. Now let's talk about higher frame rates and slow motion. One of the biggest features about the Canon R6 Mark II is that it has a full frame oversampled 4K60 and that's probably one of the most commonly used frame rates for slow motion on this camera. But what you might notice while I'm recording this in normal speed is that the motion blur is less because I have a higher shutter speed. So what you can do here is you can then take the footage and slow it down in the computer to get slow motion. So at 60 frames a second, I will slow it down to 40% and I will get a two and a half times slow-mo. So let me show you what this looks like. So as I walk back here, you can see it's just normal but as I walk towards the camera, I can now slow it down. Now, the one benefit about recording it like this is that I also get an audio recording. So that can be really handy if you wanna take one clip, use it for regular speed and slow motion. You just have to realize you're gonna have a higher shutter speed. Now, if you wanna shoot above 60 frames per second, you can do that in the R6 Mark II, but it's only gonna be in 1080p. So you have the option of 120 or 180 frames per second. Now, there is a quirk with this in the R6 Mark II and other Canon mirrorless cameras. You have to set it to high frame rate mode. And when you do that, it doesn't record any audio and it also automatically converts it to 30 frames per second and you can't change that rate. It does that in camera. So if you're shooting at 120 frames per second, it'll be a four times slow motion in 30 frames. And if you're shooting 180, it'll slow it down six times again to 30 frames per second. Now, you do lose your audio, there's nothing to do about that. In terms of the 30 frames per second, if you're working in a 24 frame per second timeline, not really a big deal. You just set the speed to 80% in your computer. I do it all the time, not a big deal. Let me show you how to set this up in the camera. All right, so if we go into the menu here, it's in the first page under the camera, page number one. If we go down to high frame rate and we select enable, you can see it goes to 1080p, 120 frames per second. It all says audio is not recorded in the high frame rate movies. So we're gonna enable this. And now if we go up to the movie record size, we only have a few options. We have 120 frames per second, 180 frames per second in IPB and IPB light. So let's show you what the 120 frames per second looks like. So I'm gonna select this and then I'll show you a clip of it. So this is what it looks like set up in the camera. You can see here that I'm at 120 frames per second and I have the shutter speed set up one over 250. Again, double the frame rate. Now I know I said you can't record audio. The reason why you can hear me right now is because I'm sending audio into the recorder, which you're recording the screen on. Anyways, it's not recording audio in the camera. So let me hit record here and then I'll show you what it looks like converted.
Now let's talk about time lapses in the R6 Mark II. And there is some weird stuff and some quirkiness with this in the R6 Mark II and all the other Canon mirrorless cameras. So first of all, when you're shooting a time lapse, you cannot have C-Log3 turned on. You have to shoot with one of the baked-in picture profiles. Also, it spits out a file in 30 frames per second, and you can't adjust that frame rate like you like it does in the high frame rate mode. And also, it records in all I, which is weird because all of the rest of the recording options are in IPB. Anyways, let me show you what's gone on the camera and how to set it up. So if we go into the menu here, and we go over to the camera and the sixth tab over, we see the time-lapse movie is grayed out. So if we click on that, it'll tell us what's going on here. It says Canon Log settings. Like I said, we can't shoot in log. And it also has an issue with the beep. And that's only if you want to turn the beep on every time it takes a photo, but I don't recommend that. So not giving me an issue. So what we need to do is we need to go back to the log shooting settings on page four and turn these off or turn log off. And so we go back to the sixth page here and now it is not grayed out. We can click on it and we can enable the time lapse. And there's a bunch of settings in here. And I actually really do like the way this is set up. So if we go under interval, this will tell the camera how often it takes a photo. So right now it's set up to take a photo every two seconds. So you can adjust this. And when you adjust this, it also automatically calculates what's going on the bottom here. So the camera will run for 10 minutes and it'll be a 10 second time lapse. So if we adjust this to let's say five seconds in between, it means it'll run longer so like 25 minutes, but it'll still be a 10 second time lapse because the number of shots stays the same. So you can change this to wherever you want and then hit okay. Then you can also change the number of shots. So this will do 300 shots. And again, this will calculate the time lapse for you. So let's say we double it to 600 shots. You'll see that it, the camera is gonna run for 10 minute, or 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes. And then it's gonna give you a 20 second time lapse instead of a 10 second time lapse. So very easy to calculate how long and, and what you're getting here. So in terms of the movie record size, you can record in uh, 1080p or 4K. I'm just glad there's a 4K option. And for the auto exposure, you can either have it uh, do the exposure on the first frame and then hold it for the rest of the time lapse, or you can have it calculate for each frame every single time it takes a shot, it'll do the exposure. Now, I'm usually shooting in manual exposure, so it doesn't really matter for me, but those options are there as well. Now the screen auto off, I usually disable this because I don't run super long time lapses and I like to be able to look at the screen and see what's going on in case something something happened. But if you're running really long time lapses, I would enable screen auto off because it'll save on battery. And lastly, this is the beep feature I was talking about. So I don't really like it beeping every time it takes a photo. So if you want that turned on, you have to go turn the beep on on the other menu and then come back in here and uh, enable that. So anyways, this is how this is, uh, how you set this up. And let me show you how to run this. So when you back out, it knows it's in time-lapse mode. It gives you the instructions here. Basically you press the shutter button to take a test shot and you can take a look and see what it looks like. And then press the movie record button to get the time-lapse started. So let me show you that. So first of all, you could take a test shot. Of course, it's not going to show anything here because I have a cap on it and it's face to the table, but you can examine it for framing and exposure and all that kind of stuff. And then when you're ready to go, we are just gonna hit the movie record button. And then when the movie record button gets hit, it brings up another menu here, which says start and stop recording, hit the shutter, or to back out, you hit the uh, the movie record button. So I'm gonna hit the shutter button, and it goes into time-lapse mode here. And you can see at the top left here that the number of shots is decreasing, and you can see how, much left, how, many, how many shots are left in the time-lapse. So pretty straightforward. If you need to stop it early, you just hit the shutter button. And that's it. And when you bring this into the computer, it will be in 30 frames per second. Now, if you want to shoot a time lapse with log on, really the only option is to run it at full speed, right? Not time lapse mode, and then just speed it up in the computer, which I actually do on occasion, depending on what I'm trying to do. But anyway, I just want to show you the limitations and how you set up time lapses. So now let's talk about stabilization because there's a couple things to point out here. Now, Canon has a weird quirk with the stabilization system in that when you're using a lens that has stabilization in the lens, you can have the lens stabilization on and the IBIS on or the lens stabilization off and the IBIS off. You can't like have the lens stab on and the IBIS off or the IBIS on and the lens stab off. It's a weird quirk. Now, if you are using a lens that does not have stabilization, you can independently turn the IBIS on and off in the camera. The way that you can control the IBIS and lens stab in the R6 Mark II when you have a lens that has stabilization is just by using the switch. So let me show you how to adjust the settings in the camera. So I'm using the RF 15-35 to right now, which does have lens stabilization. And as I said before, 
the lens stabe and IBIS are controlled together. So right now you can see that the lens and IBIS stabilization is turned off by this little icon that says off. So to control the lens and IBIS, you have to turn it on and off with the switch that's on the side of the lens. Let me show you that. So if I hit the switch on the side of the lens, you'll see that it switched to a plus. And when I turn it off, it goes off and vice versa. There is no way to control the IBIS in the camera when you have a lens that has stabilization. So if you have a lens that does not have stabilization, you can control it in the camera. In addition to that, we have digital stabilization that we can use independently of the lens stabe or IBIS. So let me show you where that is. So if you press the Q menu and you go over to stabilization, this is showing movie digital IS because again, the lens and IBIS is controlled in the cam in the, from the lens. We can turn this to on and also to enhanced. And you can see as I go from off to on to enhanced, it crops in a little bit more. And so for each of those, we'll get another layer of stabilization. And you can turn this on and off uh, without having lens and IBIS on. But if you have lens stabilization, I recommend using it. I made a detailed video about lens stabilization and the digital stabilization. I'll leave that video linked down below. So let me show you how these work in practice. All right, starting off here, I have no stabilization whatsoever. I'm using the RF 15 to 35 at 15 millimeters, holding the camera by the lens. And I just wanna give you a sense of what it's like with no stabilization whatsoever. I'm just walking here, not being extremely careful and uh, just giving you a sense of what this looks like. Now I have the lens and IBIS turned on without any digital stabilization. And one thing that people are critical about the Canon system are the wobbles in the corners on a wide angle lens. And that's frankly because the stabe is very, very strong. And this also appears in other manufacturer stabilizations, but it's personal preference here. A lot of people do have an issue with it, but this is what it looks like with the lens and IBIS on. It does smooth it out quite a bit. And one thing that's helpful is by adding some digital stabilization. So let me show you what that looks like. So now I turn the digital stabilization to the on setting and lens and IBIS are also on. And I find that this definitely helps smooth out some of the wobbles in the corners and just make it smoother overall. It does crop in a little bit, but if you have a wide angle lens like I'm using right now at 15 millimeters, I think it looks pretty good. So again, this is the lens and IBIS on with the digital turned on. So lastly, I have the digital stabilization turned on to enhance and the lens and IBIS are also turned on. And this is what it looks like. I think it looks super smooth, looks great. You are giving up even more of a crop here, but I just wanna show you what that looks like. So if you need it a little bit smoother, you could definitely have all these tools as a resource. So just demonstrating all the stabilization methods for like a vlogging situation, but you can also use this for trying to get a static shot, make it look more like a tripod. So I'm just hand holding the camera here at 35 millimeters. This is with no stabilization on whatsoever. This is with the lens and IBIS on, and you can see it all starting to look pretty smooth. Again, we're only at 35 millimeters here, but makes a big difference. So this is what it looks like with the digital stabilization turned on in addition to the lens and IBIS. Crops in a little bit, but this is what it looks like looking pretty smooth. And lastly, this is the enhanced stabilization. Crops in a little bit more, but it's a little bit smoother. And again, this is on top of the lens and IBIS. So I talked about a lot of the autofocus features while I was going through the menu, but I wanna show you how some of them work in the camera. All right, so take a look at the screen here. You can see that I have this on the human subject detection, and I also have eye tracking on, as you can see that it's tracking my eye really well. It's on auto left and right, you can change that as well. So you can see that it's working pretty well here. If you need to do touch tracking, you can just click on the subject, and now you can see that there's a double box that shows up on my eye and if you have another person you want to have it focus on all you have to do is just touch that touch the other person but if you want to cancel it you just press this button up here and it turns it off so there's another thing here i want to talk about if we go into the autofocus menu and we go to movie servo autofocus it's enabled but one thing we can talk about here is the subject detection autofocus right now it's on detect priority and so what that means is that it's looking for me because I'm the subject. That's what I'm selected as looking for humans. If I leave the frame, it will go to the background. And then when I hop back into the frame, it should focus on me because it's a priority. It's not an only mode. So if we switch this now to detect only, now when it's focusing on me because I'm the subject, when I leave the frame, it should not go to the background because it's still looking for me. And when I pack, pop back in, 
it picks me up. So this isn't a perfect uh, situation, this camera. Of course, your mileage may vary, but I just wanted to demonstrate the difference between those two. This one, it's gonna really not wanna switch. The problem with this also is if you are trying to show something to the camera, it will still try to focus on me uh, a lot more. Like if you have it on priority, you could hold things up in front of the camera and block your face and it will jump to that. But this one's really going after me. So just wanna demonstrate that. So now I wanna show you some of the manual focus assist tools that are in this camera. First of all, let's talk about focus peaking. And there's a couple ways you can do this. First of all, I have it set up in my Q menu. So I can go over to peaking and turn it on and off here. But you can also do it in the menu. So let me show you where that is. So if you go to the autofocus section to page five, you go to focus peaking and we're gonna turn this on. I have it set to high and red like I mentioned before. So now when I back out of here, you'll see that there's no focus peaking and that's because I'm in autofocus. So if I put this in manual focus, it turns the peaking on. So everything you see that's red is in focus. And this is really helpful when you are using a manual focus lens or using manual focus on an autofocus lens. And by racking focus here, like if I want to change the focus from me to let's say the lamp in the background and the picture frame back to me, I can do that rather easily with focus peaking. So the other thing that's cool in this is going to be the focus guide. So let me turn the peaking off and go to the focus guide. And this is cool because it works in combination with the tracking. So as you can see, there are these triangles and when the triangles turn green, that's when I'm in focus. So it's cool because you can see that the eye detection is working, even though I'm in manual focus, it's showing me what I should focus on. And so when I change the focus manually, when they line up green, that's when I'm in focus. So you can see I can change the focus and when the two arrows start to line up and line up with each other and turn green, then I am in focus. Really cool tool that uses a combination of the tracking features in the camera with a manual focus situation. I want to take a moment to talk about professional audio solutions for the R6 Mark II. Now the R6 Mark II, like most mirrorless cameras, has a 3.5 millimeter mic input on the side, which is great for hooking up, uh, you know, small shotgun microphones, wireless lab solutions, stuff like that, but you can't plug in XLR microphones. Now it sounds pretty good, but if you want to plug in more professional audio, then you probably want to either record externally or pick up something like this. So this is the Tascam CAXLR 2D. Uh, this was made specifically to work in the hot shoes of the, can of the more modern Canon mirrorless cameras. Now I have heard people tell me that these have failed. I haven't personally had that issue, but I just want to bring that up because I, you know, people that I've talked to have had issues with it, but I've been really gentle with it and it's been working fine for me. But this is a great solution because it just keeps you from having an extra, you know, external recorder that you have to manage and sync later. The audio gets fed directly into the, the video file. It's also great for streaming because there'll be no sync issues and stuff like that. So I want to talk for a moment about this. So this has a um, a hot shoe on the bottom that slides into the camera and then has a bunch of different stuff on here. So I kind of want to give you a tour around this and talk about it in case you are looking to pick one of these up. So first of all, on this side, we have two XLR inputs. So these are combo jacks. This is XLR and quarter inch mono. So you can have two different inputs here. It also has a third input here, which is a 3.5 millimeter stereo input. Unlike the Sony system, you can only do two um, inputs at a time. So it's either the two XLRs or the 3.5, and you can obviously plug the 3.5 directly into the camera. It has a place to hold your microphone on the top here. On the back, we have a couple different other features here. We have the output can go from the camera or to the headphone jack. So you can actually use this as a separate preamp and then this is the volume for that. So over here, we can see once we lift up, lift up the nice cover, we have the power supply options. So if it's powered by the camera, this light will turn on. If you're powering by battery and using it as an external preamp, then <clears throat> this battery will turn on. In terms of this selection here, this is the inputs. So input one will send input one, which is the XLR or quarter inch input on the other side into channels one and channel two. If you select this to the one up here, input one and two, input one will go to input one, input two will go to input two. And if you select up to the top, input three, which is a 3.5 millimeter jack, will go to the um, input one and input two. <clears throat> this thing here is the input one and two link. So if you leave it off, then they will not be linked. And if you leave it on, they will be linked. And 
This is kind of an interesting feature because if you are using one input only in your, let, let's say you have one microphone coming in your camera and you want the same audio going to the left and right channel, then you link them and then you just control the audio and it will be the same on both channels. But why this is really handy is that if you turn it off, you can actually set the level properly for channel one and then maybe have channel two be a little bit lower and set that as a safety track. So if you want to record one microphone and have two different audio levels, make sure these are not linked and then you can set the audio levels properly here. <clears throat> for input one here, we have the selection between line, mic, and plus 48 volt phantom power. So most of the time, if you're using a nice XLR microphone, you're gonna leave that on 48 volts. We have attenuation here. We have a low cut filter built in. And for input one or input three, depending on if you're using input one or input three, you can set the level manually or automatic. Of course, I'm gonna choose manual to get the most possible control. It also has a built-in limiter, which is really, really cool. Now over here on the second input section, we have the same controls for line mic and phantom power, attenuation and low cut, level and limiter. So all the same features going on here. So this is a really cool device. If you are looking to spend a little bit more, this will work in a lot of the newer Canon mirrorless cameras, like I said, and it does have pretty decent auto quality and it does, it is a very specific um, accessory, but it works pretty well. Now I wanna give you a few recommendations for accessories and lenses and stuff like that. So first of all, let's talk about ND filters because I've been talking about ND filters throughout this video and I wanna mention the one that I've been using pretty much exclusively for the last year or two. And I tested out a bunch and this is at the time, the one I found to be the best in terms of color shift and clarity and those sorts of things. And uh, so I just wanna mention that I use the Nisi True Color Variable ND. This is a one to five stop. I just really love the image that this produces and I have a couple of these now. And so this is the one I recommend if you are looking to pick one up. And as I was saying before with the variable ND, if you don't know how these work, when you rotate them, it makes it lighter and darker. So that's what I was doing when I was changing the exposure when I was outside. So anyways, Nisi True Color Variable ND. Now in terms of memory cards, I pretty much exclusively now just buying these guys here. This is the ProGrade V90 SD card. I like the 256 gig ones. They're a little bit pricey, but they work in every possible frame rate resolution that this, these cameras can do. And it works in pretty much all of my cameras. So I really do recommend, I have had no issues with the ProGrade cards. I know a lot of people are using these, I really do like them. And then for lenses, this can be a whole nother video on its own. I'll just let you know what I like to use. I am a big fan of zoom lenses. I have been basically since I started doing videography because it allows me the most flexibility and speed when I'm out shooting. Now, most of you probably know that like the Holy Trinity, the, the wide, the medium, and the telephoto lenses, they're great. And I kind of stick to that too. I have the RF 15 to 35 2.8 L lens. These are very expensive lenses and there are cheaper versions of these. The 24 to 72.8 L. And then lastly, most people will say to recommend to get the 70 to 200. I actually have the 100 to 500 because I like to do wildlife and stuff like that. So I like to have a little bit more reach. The reason why this is black, this lens is usually wet is I have a skin on this from Alpha Guard. So um, they don't, they didn't, I bought that with my own money and I just, I like it because it protects it a lot. So there are a lot of options out there for zooms. You can of course adapt EF lenses to the R6 Mark II and save a lot of money, uh, both Canon lenses and Sigma lenses. Uh, for prime lenses, there are some expensive RFL zooms that are really nice, but there's still a couple of gaps like the 24 and the 35. Canon also makes some more inexpensive RF uh, prime lenses, but they're not L lenses. Some of the older RF uh, L prime lenses are great. I also highly recommend the Sigma EF prime lenses. They're also fantastic. There's a lot of options out there, but frankly, when I'm shooting video, I'm most of the time using these prime lenses also because they have these are all stabilized lenses and the stabilization, as you saw, works really well in combination with the IBIS in the R6 Mark II. Anyways, hopefully this will get you started in becoming a more advanced shooter on the R6 Mark II. There's a lot of good information here. And again, feel free to go back through and use the, uh, the timestamps down below. I really appreciate you watching. I really appreciate Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you got value out of this video, and I hope that you did, please consider hitting subscribe down below. It'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.